I'll never remember for certain the very first arcade game I ever played, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt which one I played the most. It's hard to believe looking back how this game managed to be so popular, considering it was released six years after the film it was based on, and the same year as the final film in the series itself. Atari's Star Wars arcade game from 1983 captivated my imagination every time we visited Showbiz Pizza Place in Nashville. I was only five years old, but I would hunt down that one carpet-topped step stool Showbiz provided for shorter patrons, allowing me to step up to that unforgettable flight yoke and make another attempt to save the rebellion from the Death Star. Heck, even George Lucas seemed to enjoy it. Every other arcade game was invisible to me back then. This was the one, and it very likely was more responsible for my interest in the Rebel pilots than the movies themselves. What I didn't know at the time was the Star Wars arcade experience wouldn't begin and end with that original game. <laughs> This is killer! If you played Star Wars in arcades in the 1980s and you loved the movies, it's impossible to forget Atari's Star Wars arcade cabinet. Based on the climactic space battle over the Death Star, this very early simulator came in two flavors, your common stand-up cabinet and a deluxe seated enclosure to enhance the feeling of flying an X-Wing fighter. Atari pulled out all the stops on this game, considering the home video game market had just collapsed the previous year. With Atari's own E.T. cartridge and Parker Brothers' Empire Strikes Back cartridge being two of the biggest smoking guns, it's pretty incredible that Atari threw the kitchen sink into a Star Wars arcade game. But boy, it shows. Rather than go with more traditional raster-based pixel graphics to build the visuals, Atari utilized more cutting-edge vector-based graphics that allowed the designers to give the game a more 3D feel. The main disadvantage of this at the time was a lack of surface colors. Everything was colored lines. However, the advantages of vector-based gaming outweighed such concerns for gamers. Vector games had more fluid and responsive motion than raster games, and with Star Wars taking that into a first-person perspective greatly enhanced immersion for the player. Atari adapted John Williams' score from the film for the game and even digitized key clips of dialogue from Luke, Obi-Wan, Han Solo, You're all clear, kid. and Darth Vader to cement the player wholly in the Star Wars universe. Digitized speech was cutting edge at the time for consumer gaming, and Atari used it to superb effect. If the music, voices, and the vectors weren't enough, the Star Wars arcade game arrived in a first-class cabinet with top-to-bottom custom graphics on the sides, screen surround detailing, and a deck with unique Star Wars-style graphics. The centerpiece of this presentation was the purpose-built flight yoke of the game, not modeled specifically after either the X-Wings yoke in the film nor the Millennium Falcon's yokes, but its own Star Wars-like design. Able to pivot back and forth and turn like a racing steering wheel with dual thumb and dual finger triggers, the Star Wars arcade controller is arguably the most memorable classic arcade joystick in history, next to possibly the internally lit joystick from the Tron cabinet. The format of the game was, like many original arcade games, a series of short levels that became rapidly more difficult the longer you survived. The first step was choosing a difficulty level. 
If you chose easy, the game would allow you to skip the Death Star surface level and go straight from the opening level over the Death Star to the trench run. Medium and hard settings would present you with all of the levels and kick the game off at far greater difficulty from the outset. Every setting starts in space over the Death Star as you're beset by TIE Fighters. Even for a now 37-year-old game, the immersion is immediate. The TIE Fighters combined with the music put you in that classic Death Star battle in seconds. Let's try it standing by. Blowing away TIE Fighters never stops being fun. And make sure to hit Darth Vader's TIE Fighter as many times as you can manage as well for bonus points. The TIE Fighters send a constant barrage of snowflake-like laser blasts your way. You can shoot these down before they hit your shields, and if you're lucky you can dodge away from them so they fly past you. At higher difficulty levels, the barrages are so incessant, it's everything one can do just to keep from getting hit. You can almost forget having time to hit the fighters themselves. The second stage is the surface of the Death Star. At lower difficulties, only the red ground batteries are present. But from medium difficulty onward, the towers and the batteries present double trouble. Dodge the towers, shoot out the turrets, blow up the batteries, and stay alive. Now you're in the trench run. If you're super skilled or gloriously insane, do the entire trench run without firing your lasers until you reach the exhaust port. If you can do this and survive, that's called using the force, and it gives you big bonus points. However, if you miss the exhaust port, you start the level over with whatever shields you have remaining. Negative. Negative. It didn't go in. God help you if that happens. When you blow up the Death Star, the game kicks you back over the Death Star again for another round, this time at an even higher difficulty and with whatever shields you had left from the previous victory. If you were lucky, a points bonus might give you a few shields back, but not many. Much like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, this is an era where arcade games weren't about story, but skill and attrition to see who could last the longest, while racking up the biggest pile of points so you could place your initials on the coveted high score screen. Yes! 860,000! I, I can't believe it's still standing! The Star Wars arcade game was adapted for a number of systems, including the Commodore 64 and, shockingly, the Atari 2600, the result of which can barely be called recognizable. The game made it to a number of platforms, including PC and Amiga by the late 1980s, but all of these were pixel-based adaptations. Vector graphics require special equipment and special CRT screens to display them, which means almost 40 years later, those vintage Star Wars arcade cabinets can be maintenance nightmares when you combine the special vector screen with the unique yoke that also needs regular service attention. Oddly, the one home video game system in the 80s that could have simulated Star Wars almost perfectly, the Vectrex, did not have a licensed port of the Star Wars arcade game. Sadly, this likely came down to timing. The Vectrex, a purely vector-driven console with its own self-contained screen, was not popular enough to survive the home video game crash, and was discontinued in 1984, likely the earliest they could have completed a conversion of the game. See, I didn't have an Atari 2600. I had a Vectrex as a kid. I don't even want to remember the amount of time I spent hoping Star Wars would come out on my game console. It didn't. By 1984, the Vectrex was on closeout, but a new Star Wars arcade game landed in shopping malls across the U.S. Return of the Jedi. Wait, not The Empire Strikes Back, I can hear you say? Alas, no. Instead, we were presented with a very cool and unique-looking arcade cabinet with side graphics that are about as 80s as Star Wars ever looked. The game was full-color rasterized graphics and presented as an isometric field of play, with the motion of the screen traveling from the lower corners to the upper corners. As with Star Wars, digitized speech was featured, this time from Luke, I see them. Wait for me! Vader, Listen to me. I will deal with them myself. C-3PO Lando Leia Han And even Admiral Akbar. 
In Jedi, you begin in the forests of Endor on Leia's speeder bike, trying to outrun the biker scouts and reach the Ewok village. On the easy setting, you jump right from this level to the Falcon's race through the Death Star. On harder settings, you must first, as Chewbacca, drive the Scout Walker to the Imperial Bunker, while also flying the Falcon through the Star Destroyers toward the Death Star. Jedi's major flaw is the isometric angle combined with the original game's flight yoke. The yoke is ideal for a first-person simulation, but it's terrible when trying to maneuver a sprite through trees at high speed at a three-quarter angle. Ah. Uh. Oh, come on! Crap. 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 Oh, Seriously? Crap! 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 Come on! Come on! Ah! Oh. Ah! Oh. God! Come! Oh, come on! Crap! Oh. Yeah. Oh. Come on, come on, come on, go! Oh. You ah! Oh. Crap! 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 Now we gotta give him more. Oh. Yes, yes, yep. It's too close. After only a few tries back in 1984, I would avoid this game when seeing it in arcades. In 1985, Atari finally got around to an arcade game for The Empire Strikes Back, but many of us wouldn't find out about it until we were adults, because the game was an upgrade board for the original Star Wars cabinet. That's right. Empire was not graced with its own cabinet like the other two films. Arcade owners who ordered the game would be sent the upgrade board, a new marquee, some side logo decals, and some new decals for the deck and yoke surfaces. It seems most arcade owners were just fine with Star Wars and didn't order the upgrade kit, which is why I never saw Empire Strikes Back in arcades. And it's a shame because the game itself is actually pretty cool. The game features digitized voices from the film of the Emperor, the son of Skywalker must not become a Jedi. Darth Vader, set your force for the hot system. Luke, the meteorite is around here. Han, prepare to make the Delta light speed. C-3PO, oh thank goodness we're coming out of the asteroid field, and even General Rykian. Picked up something outside the base. It begins on the wastes of Hoth, where you pilot a snowspeeder to stop probe droids from transmitting the location of the rebel base. You have to shoot down their signals while also shooting the droids and avoiding getting shot by them in turn. As with the original game, you can blast their projectiles out of the sky. Once they get the signal out, you're in the Battle of Hoth fighting Adat walkers and scout walkers. To stop the advance of the walkers, you can shoot them in a tiny area on their face to destroy them, or you have a limited amount of tow cables to wrap their legs and drop them instantly with the press of the thumb triggers. Trick flying under an add at will win you bonus points. Drop enough probe droids or walkers in each stage to earn a letter that will eventually spell Jedi and provide you a big points bonus. The next stage finds you escaping in the Millennium Falcon and fighting off TIE fighters to reach the asteroid field. Once you reach those asteroids, it's a matter of dodging the space objects while John Williams' famous music plays out. <laughs> If you can reach safety, the game begins again on the ice fields of Hoth with increased difficulty. Given the improved gameplay in the vectors, the clearer digitized speech, and the amazing music from the Empire score, I want that shit, not The Empire Strikes Back proves to be a lost gem in this trilogy of arcade games. 
And while Star Wars gives me the biggest memory kick, I find The Empire Strikes Back is the most fun to casually play, with slightly more gameplay variety thanks to the tow cables and the multiple ways to defeat the AT, -AT walkers. In 2019, the home arcade company Arcade 1UP bundled all three of these arcade games into a single home cabinet. The machine itself is about half the size of the original Star Wars cabinet and comes adorned with the original cabinet graphics and light-up marquee. Thankfully, a special riser included with the cabinet gets it up to standing height for most people. Each game is emulated near perfectly on a modern LCD display. Good start, Danny and according to arcade game aficionados, this is the first emulation of these original vector games that accurately simulates the flash of white when you are hit by enemy fire. While this was part of the original arcade experience, emulated ROMs on home computers do not recreate this effect. The games are accessible via a user-friendly menu system, and a host of options allows you to set the game volume, graphics brightness for each title, and even simulate the original arcade monitor's scan lines for Return of the Jedi's raster graphics if you wish. The most impressive touch of the arcade 1UP cabinet is the recreated flight yoke. While not as robustly engineered as the original, this one is intended for home use, and the designers probably anticipated less wear and tear. The yoke is accurate in looks and function, and its responsiveness is just fine, but it doesn't have the refinement of the arcade original. Atari's 1983 Star Wars arcade game began my lifelong love affair with X-Wing combat simulators, and the later X-Wing PC game and Rogue Squadron titles continued that legacy. Having the arcade 1UP version at my fingertips is a welcome privilege. Being able to return to those early days of arcade gaming at Showbiz, with all of the proper sounds and visuals that evoke all kinds of lost memories, is truly priceless. <laughs> Don't you have anything better to do? And miss this? There's nothing better than watching you lose. Thank <laughs> you.